Okay, so, so the reason why I chose this topic when Uday rang me and um, he invited me to come and be a part of this was because I find that there's a lot of controversies around supplements. So when we talk about supplements, people think we're talking about protein powders or we're talking about certain substances which can increase the performance. So I thought it is a great topic to discuss and something which is very, very new as well. So a little bit about me. Um, Siddharth has already introduced, so thank you. But just a little bit more. So what do I do? I assist athletes to eat well and train because athletes don't diet and exercise. Do you agree with me? Do you agree? Yes. yes. I always tell people, I always especially tell my athletes that your bodies are not your ornaments. They are your vehicles to your dream. So look after your bodies. So before I start my presentation, I want you to look at this video, which will take away your two minutes and 30 seconds. I ate a lot of meat. They showed us commercials. Steak, that's what a man eats. Selling that idea that real men eat meat. Serious man food. But you got to understand, that's marketing. That's not based on reality. I've been teaching fighting techniques to government agencies for more than 15 years. Then, I got injured. Unable to teach for at least six months, I spent more than a thousand hours studying science on recovery and nutrition and stumbled across a study about the Roman gladiators. The gladiators were predominantly vegetarian. How could the original professional fighters be so powerful, eating only plants? When I made the switch to a plant-based diet, I qualified for my third Olympic team. I broke two American records. I was like, man, I should have done this a long while ago. When I went plant-based, I wasn't sure if I was gonna survive. And I actually became like a machine. One of the biggest misconceptions in sports nutrition is that we have to have animal protein to perform at a high level. That's just not true. Sometimes you have to do things that you know your competitors aren't doing. Today's blood and yesterday's blood. Sam. I think this is going to wake a lot of people up. I was recovering better, not getting as sore. This was our best season in the last 15 years, and we had 14 guys on plant-based diets. We all want to feel great, have more energy. Cholesterol was 276. Today, 169. Whoa, now you're talking. <laughs> Most guys my age can keep up with the grandchildren. My grandchildren can't keep up with me. It's not one set of dietary guidelines for improving your performance as an athlete. Another one for reversing heart disease, reversing diabetes. It's the same for all of them. Someone asked me, how could you get as strong as an ox without eating any meat? And my answer was, have you ever seen an ox eating meat? The reason I, why I played that video was because that's the first question I always get asked. So when I have my athletes come to the clinic, whether they are amateur bodybuilders or whether they are gym goers or whether they are competing for sports, India predominantly we are vegetarians here and we don't know whether we can have access to protein which, through natural sources. It's very, very important for us to understand how important it is for us to have natural food and not rely on supplements. So I always tell people, you do not need to add supplements to your diet. You only need supplements if you need it. You do not need to substitute your meal. It's an added advantage. Supplement can only be benefit to you if you use it, if you need it. So what is the supplement I'm going on about? Supplement is something which, is, which you only need when you have any deficiency in the body. It can come in a form of pill, it can come in a form of powder, it can come in a form of liquid, but making sure that the supplements which you are going to take is scientifically proven. 
Are you going to buy that supplement over the counter or are you going to buy it over the internet? That is the question and that is what I'm going to discuss with you all today. So the first thing why people look towards supplement is because they want to make sure that they meet the adequate requirement for protein. So the following slide, this tells you how much is the minimum amount of protein required for an athlete. So if we look at it, any sedentary man or woman needs only 0.8 gram to one gram of protein in a day per kilogram of body weight. So if you weigh 70 kilos, 70 grams of protein is enough for you for the day to meet the minimum requirement. Elite male endurance athletes, they need about 1.6 grams. Modern intensity endurance athletes need about 1.2 grams. Recreational endurance athletes, they need about 0.8 to 1 gram. Football power sports, they need about 1.4 to 1.7 grams. Resistance athletes in the early training, you need 1.5 to 1.7 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. And if you go into the steady state, you need about 1 to 1.2. But we find that people, they take up to 4 grams of protein per day per kilogram of body weight. Do we actually need that protein or not? That's the question. This is a common diet of any amateur bodybuilder who goes, to the, who goes to the gym or general, if you look at it, you will start with a pro poor protein distribution. So if you look at it, you will start with breakfast with a cup of poha, one cup of curd, and maybe in snack time you will grab two biscuits and a cup of tea. Lunch, two chapatis, one cup of curd, one cup of vegetable, one glass of coconut water maybe before training, or maybe two glasses of water before training. And then for dinner, you may end up having 10 egg whites, one cup of cooked rice, and one bowl of salad. That's a fairly poor distribution of protein. Because when you dump protein in one meal, it leads to protein oxidation. So if you want to enhance that muscle, if you want to help with the muscle recovery, muscle builds in the next 48 hours. So you need to give protein evenly distributed throughout the day. So, a good, so this is a total of 90 grams of protein per day for an individual with a very poor distribution. So good distribution would be four egg whites, two slices of toast for breakfast, snack, so about 30 grams of nuts, one cup of milk tea, two thin chapatis, one cup of curd, one cup of vegetable, one glass of coconut water, Post-training, one glass of milk. Then you're looking for dinner. You're having six egg whites, one cup of cooked rice, one bowl of salad, which also equals to 90 grams of protein. But do you see how the protein has been evenly distributed throughout the day as compared to the poor distribution of protein? So the person on the right-hand side who has a good distribution will have fair muscle recovery after the training than the person who is having a poor distribution. So the timing of protein is really, really important. So like I said in my previous slide, you cannot have protein just after the workout. A lot of people, they come to me and they say, what is going to be the best pre-workout drink? What is going to be the best post-workout drink? But ideally, you should not be concentrating just on the supplement. You should be aware of what you had for breakfast, what you had for snacks, some people go without having breakfast, without having snacks, and then they have their lunch, and then pre-workout pre and post-workout, that is not going to help them with muscle recovery. So like I said, consumption of large amount of protein in one meal, one meal leads to protein oxidation. So small amounts of proteins at meals and snacks are very important. The ideal is post-training recovery to have is to 10 to 20 grams of high biological value of protein. So can someone tell me which is the best protein you can have for muscle recovery? Did you watch my previous slide? It's about two glasses of milk. Milk is the best post-workout drink, and I highly advise people to have milk post-workout rather than relying on post-recovery supplements. 
And response is better if it's combined with carbohydrates. So milk is also a form of carbohydrates. So it works fantastic. It is cheaper as well. So roughly about for one kilogram gain in muscle mass, you need an extra 350 to 450 calorie requirement extra on top of the athlete is what it's having to actually gain one kg of muscle mass. So the facts about protein, we need to make sure the powders which you are taking is evidence-based. It is scientifically proven and the package is not bought over the internet or from, or from some random sources. Any resistance training program causes protein metabolism for 48 hours. We have seen people have four grams per kilogram of body weight, which doesn't show much of a difference on muscle, muscle mass. Is high amount of protein good for you? Certainly, it's not going to make any difference if you have more than two grams of protein per day. All you need to look at is making sure you have a fairly good distribution of protein throughout the day. It adds to a weekly shopping bill. How expensive are the protein powders? You can end up spending from minimum of 5,000 rupees for a kilogram of protein powders to about 15,000 as well. So it adds to the weekly grocery bill. It's strange enough, it doesn't show much of an impact on renal function. And also, when you keep on taking proteins, all these supplements, you ignore the other important nutrients which are required by the body. And also, it adds, a lot of them adds to the saturated and bad fats to the diet as well. So let me look at, let me show you, if a minimum person needs, a, a minimum amount of protein a person needs is 80 grams of protein a day. This is a quick guide. And this was something I was made to do for almost one, one and a half year while I was doing my training to be a student diet, when I was a student dietitian, for, uh, to count how many proteins I'm having in a day. So it's a very, very quick guide. If you look at it, 10 grams of protein in vegetarian and non-vegetarian sources, one cup of milk is 10 grams of protein, 200 grams of low-fat yogurt is 10 grams of protein, 30 grams of reduced-fat cheese, 70 grams of cottage cheese or paneer, two small eggs, 120 grams of tofu, 60 grams of nuts and seeds, one cup of soy milk, three quarters of a cup of cooked lentils and beans. When you look at non-vegetarian sources, 35 grams of cooked red meat, pork or lamb, 40 grams of skinless cooked chicken, 50 grams of cooked fish or canned tuna or salmon, and others are, of course, we're looking at 10 grams of whey protein powder. I always tell people, when you take paneer, you always drain the water away. You drain whey water. You could add that whey water in kneading your dough. You can add that to your dals, to your curries, and you can enhance the nutritive value of your curries like that. So we do have proteins in the diet. If we take it adequately, we will not need to rely on the protein powders or the supplements. So this is, these are some of my favorite pre-workout snacks, rather than using a pre-workout drink. Ragi Madi, did I say right? Ragi Madi or Ragi Madi? Yes, it's great. It's a great pre-workout snack, so you can have it two hours before or an hour and a half before. Sattu water, the gram roasted water powder. Um, chia seeds in coconut water, it works fantastic because chia seeds have got omega-3. And it also has iron and all other minerals which are required by the body, and it makes your body very hydrated. Um, adding two tablespoons of extra virgin coconut oil or an MCT oil in your black coffee. Bangalore is fantastic for coffee because every time I come to Bangalore, I get introduced to amazing coffees here because you've got amazing coffee um, states around. So I will get to that in a minute. Uh, peanut banana butter uh, banana smoothie. So. That's my favorite, and, um, and you guys must have, and uh, you must have uh, listened to Varun, and you must have seen all the recipes uh, Varun was doing. So if you are looking for a recipe, he has actually given me permission for you guys to go and um, you know, access some recipes from him. Um, so peanut butter, banana smoothie is great. Eggnog is fantastic and also adding to beetroots. So beetroots have got nitrates. It's a new study which has come that nitric oxide actually helps in vasodilation, which means that it increases the, um, 
a cardiovascular performance, but also to make you all aware that beetroot can also cause GI issues in a lot of people. So 70 ml of beetroot shot before your workout, an hour before is enough to get you going. So these are some of the natural sources how you can enhance your performance so you do not need to rely on the supplements. So when I talk about supplements, supplements, not, uh, supplements, like I said, it's not necessary we're talking about the protein powders. Supplements also include sports drinks, sports drinks which can be made at home, liquid meal supplements like Sustogen, Ensure, sports gels which are also available. These are for those athletes who are going for ultra marathon, sports bar. Sports bar can also be made at home. You can make an amazing granola bar at home. Caffeine, coffee, we know that if you're accessing freshly brewed coffee, it's going to be safe for you because it's fresh, it's in front of you. There will be no added dope elements to it. Creatinine, bicarbonate and citrate, antioxidants like vitamin C and vitamin E, electrolyte replacements, so even using electrol and glucose is approved. Iron supplements, because a lot of female athletes, they need iron, so iron is something which is very important. Calcium supplement as well, and looking, making sure vitamin D. So I always make sure I check my athletes' vitamin D and B12 because they're very, very important, especially for Indian diet, because we do lack vitamin D in our diet. So making sure our vitamin D is correct. And probiotics for gastrointestinal health, because a lot of athletes, they have GI issues and GI athletes' gut as well. So these, would, these are something which I would actually categorize as supplement because natural food can also be a supplement, it's just not the protein powders. So when you look at this supplement, the way you have to think is, do you actually need it? Is it suitable for you? Are you do you need it for your muscle recovery? Do you, need to increase, do you need to involve this in your diet because you want to increase your performance? What is the main purpose of this supplement? And do you actually need it? Whether it's in the form of a pill, a powder, or is it in the form of a natural food? What is the mode of delivery? Are you getting it over the counter? Are you getting it through, you know, are you going to make it at home? Or is whether it is scientific or not? Because having that scientific merit is very, very important for a supplement. Because you have to have, you have to train your coach, coaches, coaches and athletes. You need to train your, um, you know, you need to train and you need to increase that knowledge that not everything which you get is going to be scientifically, um, scientific, scientifically be proven. So that was the category A, which I just discussed. And we have categorized this at AIS, which is the Australian Institute of Sports. And those were the supplements which actually provide good, useful, and timely source of energy and nutrients to the athlete's diet. There are scientific trials to prove a performance benefit. So when I was talking about caffeine, caffeine was removed from world Anti-Doping Association in January 2004. And um, that was the time when I was in Australia and doing my um, studies. And um, I was one of the guinea pigs. And my um, professor, actually, he made me have a lot, of, a lot of coffee. And he made me run on the treadmill to see the performance, um, because that became more area of interest to sports dietitians and nutritionists once it got removed from WADA. Caffeine reaches a peak concentration in the blood within one hour of ingestion. It has shown as an ergogenic benefit of caffeine can show benefit up to six hours after the ingestion. So if you want, you can give your athletes caffeine uh, at least one and a half hour prior to the workout. It enhances endurance and acts as a training aid. A minimum requirement you would look at is one milligram of caffeine per kilogram of body weight, maximum going up to three milligrams, which makes up to 70 to 150 milligrams of caffeine. So make sure your coffee is freshly brewed. It's not stale, it's not there for like a year or a year and a half or even six months old because that will lose the caffeine content. And you, even if you're having an Americano, it's not going to show any difference. So make sure it is um, fresh. And um, people respond differently to coffee. Like I cannot tolerate coffee for like more than one cup of coffee and you, it can also dehydrate you. So making sure that for every one, of, one cup of coffee, you have two glasses of water as well. Now, caffeine um, has been some area of interest of, and of research to a lot of sports dietitians. So cola, energy drinks, um, they also have caffeine in it. Uh, but my favorite, personal favorite, is just having a black coffee. 
So creatine is the other one, and um, I do not, like when I'm going through this um, presentation, I don't appreciate people to actually use this. You only need it when, you only need to use it if um, you, there is a need for it. So creatine is something which has actually come into um, the approval list of use of supplements. And um, it was first used in 1992 in Barcelonian games. And um, in 1992 as well, it was recognized that it can be used. And it acts as a fuel, we all know, for muscle stores. And vegetarians, unfortunately, we lack that store uh, through the diet, but non-vegetarians do have access to the creatinine more, because if you're having chicken, chicken breast, they are rich sources of creatine. Um, the, unfortunately, creatine declines with age, and um, it's more useful for um, lean growth in high-intensity workout and, of course, m muscle hypertrophy. And it may lead to cramps, muscle tear, and, short, and can also lead to short weight gain of 500 to 700 grams load. And 20 to 25 grams should be split over five days. So too much of supplement should not be given to anybody. The reason why I've got the dosage there is in case if you've got someone who is using creatine powder, you can actually go back and check how much are they consuming because you don't want them to overdose on these powders. And I'm definitely not judgmental. If somebody comes to me, and I would definitely educate my clients not to use it, but if they still, still want, they are free to use it. I will not stop as long as it is um, evidence-based and ethical. Um, and so initially, I would give them 20 to 25 grams split over five days, and then I would give three grams per day for 28 days at the maximum, then you taper it down. It takes about four to five weeks to, for the muscle creatine stores to get back to normal. Sodium bicarbonate is another one, um, it's baking soda. So after this today's session, I don't want anyone to go home and start having baking soda powder because that's gonna increase your performance. Um, it's just the research which is there. Um, it helps, it acts as a buffer. Um, it helps in balancing your um, hydrogen ions um, in the muscles after workout. Um, Cause some of these research, how do they actually manage to figure out what works and what doesn't work? Um, the protocols are to ingest bicarbonate powder one to two hours before workout, and four to five teaspoons of bicarbonate, bicarbonate powder is enough, and it should be done in maximum one liter, and you have to dilute that in one liter of water. Um, it does cause GI disturbance and cramping, so that's why you have to make sure you don't give the athlete just before, um, you know, before, um, before the game or something. You just have to make sure the athlete is used to having it, so uh, you concentrate has to be divided throughout at least two to three months before the game. It's beneficial for events like, um, with in, 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 events with maximum intensity of saturation, or is maximum one to seven minutes. Uh, mostly swimmers, kayaks, rowers, and canoeing events, they use um, sodium bicarbonate as one of the supplements. Brown chain amino acids. I was really hoping that this would not get approved, but fortunately this is approved now. And um, these are some of the essential amino acids which is not produced by the body. So we are looking at leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And um, leucine to be considered as favorite because that really, really helps in muscle recovery. And a minimum of two to three grams leucine is good enough. That's why I said uh, milk is a great source. So if you have milk, two to three grams, two glasses of milk after workout, you would be pretty much meeting at least one gram, or one gram of leucine after, after the workout. Um, it does help in muscle fuel source um, during exercise. And uh, there are questions whether a whey, uh, whole protein is better over BCAA or it does reduce serotonin, which can cause fatigue and also can cause mental memory issues in some of the athletes. And it does interfere with tryptophan into the brain as well. So that's why this is something which is avoidable, but naturally, if you can take it, it's fantastic. So these are the supplements, which is called as category B, and they, are not, they do not have too much of evidence, but these are some of the areas or some of the supplements which um, athletes and coaches, they are interested, and sports dietitians and nutritionists, they are interested in investigating that. Um, I would suggest just remember these names, and next time when you find someone using these powders and if they've got these ingredients and they're selling it, they certainly don't need it. One of them is beta alanine, glutamine, um, HMB. HMB is very, very popular, but uh, you really don't need HMB, and, um, and that is something which can be avoided as well. A minimum of 1.5 grams to 3 grams of HMB is what you would look at, but still there are not many scientific studies to prove that. 
Um, colostrum, which was, um, we all know colostrum is produced as mother's milk, but um, in the first few days in mother's milk, that does Im improve the immunity. Um, and, but um, it has been used as a sports supplement, and there are a lot of supplements which are selling colostrum um, internationally as well. So um, you don't really need it because it's very expensive to buy. Um, ribose is another one, glucosamine is another one, and melatonin. So these ones are still under an investigation. They are not yet proven benefit for these. So like I said, these, are, these remain the area of interest to coaches and athletes. Um, they are new to have received any adequate scientific nutrition attention. And also there are some hints that it could make any benefit, but not necessarily. Another category is group C. So in this category, the supplements do not show any scientific evidence. They do not work at all. So there is a likelihood of benefits in very small amount, that's all. And they are not proven worthwhile in enhancement of sports performance. Amino acids, carnitine, carnitine being so common, everyone, like, ma'am, we want to be, uh, build the body, or we want to reduce the fat stores. Why would you want to reduce your fat stores if you want to be an ultra marathon? Because you need that fat as fuel. You need carbohydrate as your fuel. And um, I'm sure you have heard the presentations today. These macronutrients, along with the proteins, are very, very important as a um, source of energy. So carnitine is very popular as burning fat. So if your athletes are huge and they want to get down to a goal weight, when they want to, when I mean huge, I'm not talking about the muscle mass, it's the fat percentage. Of, if they want to bring the fat percentage, which is required, minimum required, you can use carnitine at that stage, but do not use it on the long term. Um, quadriceps and uh, chromium piclet. Um, chromium deficiency is very rare in, in, in human body. So you don't need actually the supplements for that. Uh, cordyceps are basically extracted from mushroom and they have found some benefits in China and Korea. Uh, coenzyme Q10, we don't need it, ginseng as well. So this ginseng story is about increasing um, muscle, it decreases um, muscle fatigue and that's the reason why they take it and they also find some of the studies they've found that uh, it increases the memory. Um, that's why they have used it um, and it has been an area of interest in some of the um, sports, uh, sports uh, population. Uh, ferulic acid, ionine, uh, inosine, and MCT, so medium chain triglyceride. Um, I personally, I would go for medium chain triglyceride. I would not go by the scientific because medium chain triglyceride is available in coconut oil, and it acts as a source of fuel for those uh, athletes who are going for marathon and ultra marathon because they, they, they store glycogen and they store, uh, they store glycogen, so they, they are able to perform better when they actually take MCT. And that's the reason why I say that you can add two tablespoons of coconut, coconut oil in a cup of black, tea, uh, black coffee, and you can have it before your performance as a pre-workout. So banned, banned is totally banned. Did someone hear the presentation before lunch today? Or were you all waiting for lunch? Yeah, we did hear Dr. Daga talk about it. Yep, so it's definitely, it's not allowed, it's not safe, and I certainly don't agree um, giving this to anybody, even if my athletes, they would come and ask me to give them. Uh, there are some bodies which actually uh, give accreditation, like FDA, informed sports being really good. So if somebody's looking for supplement, they can look at that um, information on the box or the bottle. Um, uh, HASTA is another one, human and um, Supplement Testing Australia, they also do some of the testings. Um, we have got Fazans in Australia, uh, food, and, uh, food, and, uh, food Standards Australia. They also do some of the testings, and in India we have got ICI, ISI, so some of the trademarks to look for when you actually look, uh, look at buying the supplements. Please do not buy it if they do not have any of the standard um, scientific merit to it. So pros and cons of using a supplement, it does assist in many ways. It helps in meeting the nutritional requirements, but only, like I said, calcium deficiency, vitamin D. There are also supplements. It can help in performance. It helps in psychological boost. For me, a patient's psychology and athlete psychology is very, very important. So even if I give them black coffee with a little bit of coconut oil, and if that can help them um, psychologically as well, I would be happy to do that. Um, but sometimes it can be expensive. 
not all athletes would be willing to pay. Like, for example, I showed ribose. Ribose is a new area of interest for a lot of people, but ribose, it sells in about 700 Australian dollars for a kilogram, and you need a minimum of 60 grams per day to meet that, um, you know, to increase your performance. So I would not go for something like that. Um, obviously, we have to be very, very cautious of doping outcomes and redirection of resources from real performing enhancing factors. So definitely, I, I would say it loud that do not use any antidote. So supplements can be used through a systematic approach only. Your bodies are not your ornaments. It's a vehicle of your dreams, so choose your fuel wisely. So I conclude my session today. Thank you all for listening to me, and um, wish you have a great day.